Greetings, YouTube. Uh, last night, I was running an old part at work, and it's an old mold design. It's a type of design that you will not see any longer when it comes to uh, the mold, modern molds. Um, essentially, this mold is like a Model T Ford. It is very old. It is very clunky. Um, and in a lot of the older molds that we have, they are designed to be trimless, and to achieve that, you put fabric in the top of the cavity, and the fabric catches all the start all the pieces of rubber you don't want on your part. Um, I don't like these mold designs because it means I'm having to put two pieces of fabric in the top of this mold every single cycle. Uh, the fabric is kind of like this Tyvex type, type material. It's white. It very much looks like Tyvex. Um, but to put them in there and you run your inserts and you take these, you have to take these things out and throw them away. It's very wasteful. I hate it. I got no choice. Um, when you run this fabric, and again, we have numerous molds like this. Um, you want the fabric to stick to the top because that way you can glance at the fabric real easy. So make sure everything's on the fabric that's supposed to be there, that none of the pieces of the rubber are broken off and are sticking in a place you don't want them. Um, and you achieve that by just lubing the mold. You spray lube on the parts you don't want it to stick to, and then the fabric goes in the opposite direction. It's very simple. Every single press has a built-in air gun, lube gun. Actually, an air gun and a lube gun. Um, so you lube it, blow out the excess, you go. You probably have to do that every five or six, maybe seven cycles if you're in, if you're lucky. Well, this mold I worked on last night was designed by some kind of a genius. He wasn't satisfied with the idea of having an operator spray the mold so that the fabric could stick on the top. No. He decided that he had to come up with a solution. His solution was to design the mold so that there are a dozen, 12, steel spikes in the top of the mold. Tooth steel spikes that pierce the fabric. So when the mold opens, the spikes pull the fabric to the top of the mold, which then means the operator has to reach in there, grab those two pieces of fabric with both your hands, and rip the fabric off of a dozen toothed spikes. It's not pleasant. And if you're lucky and you hit right, you're going to do it 127 times over the course of your night. It's not fun. And the guy that designed it um, would never going to have to deal with it. He is completely isolated, completely safe from the consequences of his design. I'm sure that he never even ran a single cycle. He probably had some intern do it, or maybe the low, the engineer that's, you know, at the bottom of the totem pole ran the, ran the cycles to, you know, to run your test pieces to see if the mold worked. So he never had to deal with the atrocity of a design that he came up with. He designed a system that burdens the operator, that puts obstacles in their path, that he will never have to confront. That was his privilege. Now, some of you have probably already figured out by now, I'm not just talking about a crappy mold, though I am talking about a very poorly designed mold. No, I'm talking about privilege. And in America, privilege can be lots of different things. It can be white privilege, male privilege, straight privilege, cis privilege, it could be Christian privilege, it could be able-bodied privilege. All of those things are different kinds of privilege that all of us in America, for the most part, enjoy. You're going to enjoy at least one of those. And some of us get you to enjoy lots of them. And we get so used to them that it's easy to ignore them. They become invisible. They become the norm. They become just what you expect. And when somebody points that out to you, that these things are your privilege, that they allow you to not notice the burden that that privilege has placed upon others, they allow you not to notice the obstacles you have placed in other people's paths. Some people get real testy about that. Um, they get angry. 
And while I understand why they're doing that, because someone is pointing out something they don't want to find out about, they don't want to see, they're the fish in the ocean that can't find the ocean. They're the fish wanting swimming around going, where's the ocean? This is just water. But it's, it's right there. They're in it. And lots of us live in our privilege, and we've never had to confront it. It was decades. I lived for decades, like 40 years, before I came to understand just how much of a burden men place on women in our society. I thought we were on a curve towards a racist, racist-free America, a world that was post-racist. And then, of course, the 2016 elections happened, and then again in 20, 2020. And the world showed me how much we haven't grown. How many white nationalists and people cleaving to white supremacy exist in our society, all absolutely blind to the privilege of being white. It's heartbreaking to me that so many people can't appreciate what they have and understand what they have denied others to achieve that. If you're a white American, you have benefited from racism in the past and in the present. That's just the way it is. You can argue about it, but it won't help. It's just a fact of our nature. We have built systems that benefit white people. We have built systems that benefit men over women. We have built systems that benefit straight people over gay people. Benefit cis people over trans people. Benefit the able-bodied over those who have disability. That benefit Christians against everybody else. And we have to confront these things. We have to disassemble them, redesign them, come up with better solutions than the ones that we currently have. Remove the obstacles that we have placed in people's way. Take the burdens off their shoulders. So you're not making somebody struggle every damn day of their life. A struggle that if you want to, you can just ignore. Because that is your privilege.